So right now, let's kind of recap where we've been. And then we'll lead into chapters 10 to 12, which is all basically one unit. Chapters 10 to 12 should have been one chapter. So we'll figure out what is in that, what it means uh, for Daniel, what it meant for God's people, the Jewish people in the BC times uh, up before Jesus. And then we'll talk about Jesus and how he viewed this up to AD 70. And then we'll talk about what are we going to do with this? What does this mean for Christians today? Okay. So when we recap, um, so last week we talked about chapters eight and nine. And if we look at the, the big picture of Daniel, um, if you go back to the Bible Project's Daniel video and watch it from start to finish. Um, so the first six chapters, of course, are Daniel's uh, adventures, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are in there. Um, it's setting up the sovereignty of God, how no matter what happens on uh, in kingdoms on earth, God is still in control over all. Uh, we see that in chapter two with the dream statue. Then when we get to chapter seven, that was the son of man chapter. Um, that's where we saw, um, you know, all of the beasts come out of the water, out of the chaos and, um, you know, try to hurt God's people. And then God condemns the beasts and um, elevates one like a son of man um, to divine status, uh, which as Christians, we look back and we see that as Jesus coming to earth as a human and then God elevating him um, um, through the cross to um, divine power. So when we get to chapters eight and nine, now that we know about how in the end God wins, <laughs> that really helps us understand the last part of Daniel. And so chapters eight and nine are specifically um, like zooming in on two particular kingdoms that are mentioned back in chapter two uh, in that dream statue. And so in chapter eight was the ram and the goat representing um, Persia and Greece. So we learned a lot of details about that and how they fight each other and how Greece wins. Um, so that was in chapter eight. Chapter nine was Daniel realizing that, hey, we've been in exile now about 70 years, which is what Jeremiah said. And so he uh, repents, he prays and petitions God um, on behalf of the people in the hopes that God will respond and keep his word, that they can return back and be restored to Jerusalem. Um, as we find out, it's not that easy. Some of the Jewish people are still in rebellion against God. And last week we talked about the, um, the Hebraic Jews versus the Hellenistic Jews and that kind of culture war that was happening. Uh, there were some Jewish people who were still in, um, it says in the scripture, in rebellion against God. And, and you can't return from exile if you're still being punished for that rebellion. So that's where we ended up uh, in chapter nine, but then taking that lesson a step further and thinking about how Jesus viewed the book of Daniel and these specific chapters and how he applied it to the destruction. Well, he foretold the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70. And so, um, what's really interesting is that Daniel is having these visions while at that point, while he's still in Babylon and these visions are foretelling things that are happening 200 years in the future, 400 years in the future and beyond. And so for him to sit there and try to imagine how all of this is going to play out must've been very confusing for him at, at first, at least until the angel Gabriel came and gave him some perspective and some more information. Um, now chapters 10 to 12 is no different. Chapters 10 to 12, again, Daniel is still here 
Um, at this point, um, he's now in the Persian Empire. Cyrus the Great has come and conquered Babylon. And so Daniel still is several hundred years out from what is going to happen according to the visions. And so he won't actually get to see it happen, which is really an interesting perspective to think from because some of the stuff that's in, especially chapter 11, we're going to get into um, pretty graphic uh, and shocking uh, warfare between kingdoms and um you know, Daniel is hearing about all of this and trying to process this, even though he'll never get to see any of this happen. So try to keep that in mind as we go through this. Put yourself in Daniel's shoes. What would this have been like for him um, to hear all of these, um, the stories from the visions and to see what he saw through the vision? So keep that in mind. So as we... As we try to break down what's happening in chapters 10 to 12, um, again, I've got my Bible gateway up here on my split screen. Um, and so I'll kind of hit the high points like we did last week. I'm not going to cover everything. I really want to give you a good overview and show you how this fits in to the context of Daniel. Because chapters 10 to 12 are often used in the end times theology, um, also called eschatology. So what's going to happen uh, around the second coming of Christ? And so there's, a, there's a, a group of Christians who ascribe to this end times theology, and a lot of their proof texts come back to Daniel's 10 to 12. Well, even more than that, 7 to 12, really. And what they do is kind of, you know, pick parts that talk about the end times without considering the rest of the historical context of what's happening in that time period when Daniel's getting the vision. And so what I want to do is just really focus on the historical point of view because um, it really sets up a pattern that once we learn the pattern, we see this happen with every king and every empire throughout history. And so um, in one sense, uh, yes, this happened historically, and it's going to keep happening. Um, and so God is preparing Daniel and the readers of the book of Daniel, which includes us, uh, to see this pattern being set up. So let's open with chapter 10. Um, in the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia. Okay, there's a clue. I'm going to stop. In the first year of Cyrus, do you remember what big event happened? What did Cyrus do with the Jewish people in exile? Does anybody remember that? It happens in the book of Ezra. Think Ezra, Nehemiah. Has anybody studied that yet? Um that's when King Cyrus made an edict to send the captives back to Jerusalem to rebuild the temple and to rebuild the walls around Jerusalem. That's what the books of Ezra and Nehemiah are all about. And so that happens in the first year of King Cyrus. Now, by this point, Daniel is a very elderly man. Uh, he lived to be over 80 maybe around 85, and he is approaching the end of his life here. He is too old to return with the exiles. So the first wave of exiles to go back included Zerubbabel, and he was really the, the man who organized the rebuilding of the temple. And then later, more successive waves of exiles went back, including one led by Ezra, and then another one led by Nehemiah. Ezra went back in 458 BC. Nehemiah went back in 444 BC. Um, but when we get to this point, like just even in the first few words of verse one, that gives us a lot of context right there in the third year of Cyrus. So Daniel is probably very well aware of what's happening when Zerubbabel takes that first wave 
of exiles back to Jerusalem. If you read in Ezra chapter one through four, which you can do on your own later, um, the exiles who went back encountered a lot of opposition, not only from their own people who lived there, um, but from the outsiders as well, people who lived around Jerusalem. And there was a lot, so much opposition that it even stopped the work on multiple occasions. And they had to get, um, they had to send a letter back to the king to s tell everybody, okay, it, you know, I gave them permission, they can work. Um, because again, when, when your God has a temple, you now have power. Your God has power again. And a lot of people rejoiced when the Jewish temple was destroyed because that meant uh, in their pagan view that the God of heaven was destroyed, which of course we know is not the case. He's been working behind the scenes here. So when we get to verse one, um, we see that it's this time is it's a couple years after when that happened. And we know from Ezra that that opposition was so intense. That might be what Daniel is mourning about in this chapter. So in verse two, at that time, I, Daniel mourned for three weeks. I ate no choice food, no meat or wine touched my lips. And I used no lotions at all until the three weeks were over. So, um, kind of like chapter one with the food, um, he, he was fasting and mourning. So he used no lotions. That's, that's like our modern deodorant, right? They had perfumed oils and things, um, which you used when you were happy and cheerful and things were well, you did not use those during mourning. Um, so we think that's why Daniel was mourning, knowing the opposition that was happening, that was preventing God's temple from being rebuilt. They've waited 70 years for this. And now that they get to go back to Jerusalem, they still can't build the temple. It was awful for them. And so here we are. Verse four gives us another clue on the 24th day of the first month. So on the Jewish calendar, that would have been the beginning of, of their year, which would have been, I want to say March, April um, ish. And that would have been during their festival season with Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread and all of this food and celebrations. And what is Daniel doing? He is not celebrating. He is mourning. So it's kind of, kind of ironic and sad that he's not feasting uh, at the tr traditional times because he's thinking about this. And then he looked up there before me was a man dressed in linen. So white linen was worn by the priests and also angelic beings. We think this was an angelic being. Probably we'll just call him an angel. Um, and so it describes this being. And what it looks like is that he is reflecting the glory of God. If you think about when Moses went on Mount Sinai and he came down glowing, right? This, this is described, this heavenly being is described as his face like lightning. So something very similar. Eyes like flaming torches. Um, in verse 7, what's interesting, it's kind of like, uh, you know, in the New Testament where Saul has his road to Damascus. And he's the only one that hears the voice of Jesus. And there's other people around him. Daniel has this too. Uh, he was the only one who saw it. Those who were with me did not see it. But such terror overwhelmed them that they fled and hid themselves. So this is no common encounter with a normal human. Uh, it almost looks like he passes out. I fell into a deep sleep, my face to the ground. Uh, this angelic being touched him and uh, restored him and then explains what's happening. Uh, he, I love how he says, do not be afraid, Daniel, since the first day that you set your mind to gain understanding and to humble yourself before your God, your words were heard. That's so cool. 
that God hears our prayer. Uh, and I have come in response to them. Remember, Daniel wanted to learn more, especially in um, chapter eight. He really wanted to learn more about what was happening with um, Persia and with Greece. He was very concerned about that and how it would affect the Jewish people. Um, so he comes to explain it. But here's where we get a glimpse into the heavenly realm here. Uh, verse 13 in chapter 10 but the prince of the Persian kingdom resisted me 21 days. So he's like, oh, I'm sorry I'm late. I was delayed in a spiritual battle. Uh, that just cracks me up. Um, now I've come to explain to you. <laughs> Does that not crack you guys up? It's kind of weird. <laughs> I mean, very rarely do we get this curtain pulled back because, you know, like, there's like heaven and earth. It's kind of like a Venn diagram, right? You, you collide them together mm -hmm. and there's this space where they overlap a little bit. Um, and that's what we're seeing. We're getting a glimpse into that. And, um, you know, while it's not directly said, this, this could possibly be Gabriel speaking. He's come and talked to Daniel before. And um, so he says again, twice, do not be afraid. Hi, Brenda. Glad you're here. <laughs> um, okay. So again, the angel gives him strength. He says, speak, my Lord, since you have given me strength. And then again, rhetorically, do you know why I have come to you? <laughs> he is going to explain what is to come. Um, God is giving Daniel this explanation through this heavenly being. And... That's where chapter 11 starts, is what the vision is. Um, now, I know the class is the historical perspective on Daniel, so I'm not necessarily prepared to talk about spiritual warfare, <laughs> but know that that is what is happening in chapter 10. We get a glimpse into what, uh, what these spiritual battles look like, uh, and it sort of mirrors battles that happen on earth with, um, you know, the forces of God, uh, versus the forces of darkness. And so, um, Oh, something else I wanted to mention, I got ahead of myself. If you go back to verse four, where is Daniel at what it says he's on the bank of the great river, which one are you guys I'm looking at that? Uh-huh. Yeah, the Tigris River. Um, Babylon is not on the Tigris River. It's on the Euphrates. So the rivers sort of run parallel up through um, Iraq and then up to Turkey. Um, so it's interesting to me that he is not in Babylon right now. He might be traveling and he had people with him. Um, so already he's away from home and he gets this, um, this almost scary vision and he's overwhelmed and, um, nearly fainted. So, uh, but what I like about this um, to kind of wrap up chapter 10 is that, um, God strengthened him through this angelic being. And, you know, it's, it's a good parallel even to us today when we go through, you know, different um, medical issues or situations at work or, you know, different situations in life where we feel overwhelmed. It always amazes me how God is always there ready to um, do what this angel did to comfort us and strengthen us and give us the will to keep going. And so that's where, where Daniel is at. He finally says, okay, all right, let's do this. <laughs> Speak, my Lord, since you have given me strength. Now that you've given me strength, I think I can handle this. So any thoughts on uh, chapter 10 before we move on and tackle 11? Anything stand out to you? He mentions Michael. Yes. Is that supposed to be the angel Michael? Yes, um, it is. Uh -huh. Yeah. 
um, in, in this case, uh, Michael is like the protector of Israel. He's the protector of God's people. And at the moment, um, I, hang on, let me look at my notes here. So at the moment, part of the reason Daniel is upset in some of these visions is because, you know, Daniel really wanted that 70 years to be done right then. He had hope that like right on the dot, God would send them back, but that's not the message he got, right? The The message was there's, there's still some in rebellion. So, you know, you're going to be here a little while longer. And in fact, what, what we've discovered is, um, you know, and through chapter 10, it shows that, um, that the Persian kingdom uh, won't be the end of exile. It will still be going on even to the Greek empire. Mm -hmm. And so Daniel's, you know, I would be disappointed by that news too. Oh, yeah. um, but Michael would be there trying to protect God's people because remember God at this point, he had left his people. He was supporting Cyrus. Yeah, one in, in one verse, um, I believe it's in Ezra. I owe you an answer on that. But, you know, Cyrus is called a Messiah because he saved God's people and sent them back to Jerusalem. So anyway, so in the background, uh, you know, if you pull back the curtain to the spiritual side, uh, you know, Michael is there still trying to protect God's people, even when God has departed from them. Now we know that God will come back to his people. Um, and, you know, he also, as Christians believe, he comes through Jesus back to live with his people, to dwell with his people. Um, but at that time, that exile was really hard because, um, you know, they felt separated from God. And so at least Michael was there to help protect them. That's all about all we know about Michael. <laughs> He's not mentioned a lot, uh, except he is mentioned a couple times in the New Testament, one as an archangel, but definitely here, he's a protector of God's people. Other thoughts? Okay. Let's tackle chapter 11. Now I panicked a little bit when I read through chapter 11. Um, we could spend 10 weeks on just this chapter. Uh, this would be a, a, a section, you know, of a college class on the Greek empire because there's so much. Um, oh, shoot. I was going to get a chart for you. Let me see if I can pull that up. Um, because there are multiple generations involved in this. There's a lot of palace intrigue. There's a lot of um, assassinations. Uh, it's it's um, a longer period. And there's a lot that happens. And what's amazing about chapter 11 is that in a nutshell, what we're seeing is that, and what we've seen throughout the rest of Daniel is that, you know, Satan is looking for ways to destroy God's people. And, you know, we've already seen that with the exile. Um, although the exile, of course, was also considered punishment, uh, you know, back from Deuteronomy, God said, if you follow me, things will go well. If you don't follow me, you'll go in to exile, which they did. Um, but at the same time, you know, Satan is still looking for ways to um, destroy God's people. And so when we get to chapter 11, this really um, goes into a lot of depth about the Greek, well, about the Persian kingdom first, and then about Greece. And it shows multiple ways that um, God's people are in danger, will be persecuted, and maybe even martyred, if it comes to that. Um, and so thinking about the Persians, when you think Persians, of course, Cyrus is the one that sent 
the exiles back to Jerusalem to rebuild the temple, but also there's Xerxes. And so at the beginning of chapter 11, um, in verse two, so this is still part of the same, dis, the same conversation that this angel is having with Daniel. And he says, now then I tell you the truth, three more kings will arise in Persia and then a fourth who will be far richer than others. Um, scholars think this is Xerxes of Esther fame. <laughs> and so we all know the Esther side of the story. Um, you know, Xerxes married Esther and Xerxes nearly under his watch, nearly let the Jewish people be annihilated. And it was Esther and Mordecai who warned him, right? And uh, they were able to save God's people. That was a close one. Very close indeed. Another example of Satan trying to find ways to destroy God's people. Um, and so it's interesting here that in chapter 11, verse 4, um, this is a call out to a bigger story that happens in the book of Esther. So Daniel, in the book of Daniel, it references other books that are in the Old Testament and other stories. And we'll see that here in, in chapter 11. Um, it has the backdrop of the book of Jeremiah. And then chapter 12, when we get there, has the background of the book of Ezekiel. And so when we read Daniel, in other words, we can't just only myopically look at Daniel by itself. There's a lot more happening at the same time. And that's what we'll get into in chapter 11. Okay, so that's Persia. So four kings... After he has arisen, his empire will be broken up and parceled out toward the four winds of heaven. Oh, I forgot verse three. Sorry. So um, let me let me go back to verse two. When he has gained power by his wealth, that's Xerxes, referencing Xerxes, he will stir up everyone against the kingdom of Greece, which he did. If you read in the book of Esther, we talked a little bit about this last week. Um, before Esther went through all her beauty treatments and things um, before all of that. Xerxes had a failed expedition to Greece to try to uh, take it over. And he came back very upset because he failed. Um, they provoked Greece a lot. So the Persians have the reputation of amassing lots of wealth and poking at the Greeks and trying to take over their land. But in the end, verse three, then a mighty king will arise who will rule with great power and do what he pleases. After he has arisen, his empire will be broken up and parceled out toward the four winds of heaven. It will not go to his descendants, nor will it have the power he exercised because his empire will be uprooted and given to others. All right, based on what you remember from chapter two, and maybe chapter five and chapter eight, which, which kingdom came after Greece and then the main ruler died and it was given to four? Rome. The Roman. Oh, wait, you know what? Did I say Greece? I meant which kingdom came after Persia? I lied. I'm so sorry. <laughs> which kingdom came after Persia and then was split up into four? Greece. go back one Greece yeah Greece. sorry about that you know what you know what would help us here that picture <laughs> I'm a picture person let's do a picture okay <laughs> there we go can you guys see yes can you see the picture of the chapter two statue yes excellent <laughs> thank you okay so Babylon, by this point, is already done for. Daniel is living in the Persian Empire under Cyrus. So in verse, in verse 2, Persia stirs up Greece. Verse 3, Greece comes and takes over Persia, which back to the chapter 2 statue 
falls right in line chronologically. So Greece is now the power and it was, it was Alexander the Great who came and took over the Persian empire very swiftly. Remember he was the leopard um, from chapter, was that chapter five? No. What was that? Where we drew it. Seven. 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 They're all running together. <laughs> I know. I need a better chart. <laughs> I believe it was in seven, but I'm yeah. not sure. It was it was seven because I remember Beth's son of man drawing and it was glorious. So <laughs> <laughs> See, pictures help us remember. Okay. Right? It's, it's very true. Okay. Now that we've cleared that up. Okay. So um, this is now saying in the future, after Xerxes at a point, there's really only one ruler after Xerxes that we talk about, Artaxerxes, his son, and, and Nehemiah worked for Artaxerxes. Um, but after that... Alexander the Great came and took over and it became the Greek Empire. And so that is where chapter 11 spends most of its time. It, it parks on the Greek Empire. And when Alexander the Great died, remember all of the land, the territory was split up between his four generals. And in chapter 11, it really only focuses on on two of those generals, the one who controlled Egypt, Ptolemy was his name, and the one who controlled Syria, uh, which was north of Palestine, and uh, his name was Seleucus. And so those two came to power, and all those, all those four generals kept fighting each other to steal each other's territory because they wanted a big empire too, like what Alexander had. Um, so that's why it says in verse four, nor will it have the power he exercised because his empire will be uprooted and given to others. It was split up. So it wasn't as powerful. And so the whole point of chapter 11 is showing the infighting between these generals and their descendants. And it goes on for generations. And um, that was the, the intrigue that I mentioned. Um, I have a really great article that I'll share in the video description that will, well, and also um, I have a link online to Josephus. They, they both talk about this and um, all of the different fighting between the factions of the Ptolemies and the Seleucids. And, um, you know, so the Seleucids um, actually would give their daughters in marriage to the Ptolemies, hope, hoping that the daughter would be a spy. But then it turns out she took her husband's side on the Ptolemies and then he couldn't have any power. I mean, it's like, wow. Um, we're not going to spend our class time on the intrigue part of it. Um, suffice to say that when we get later in chapter 11, let's get down here a little bit to verse 36. That is where it refers back to the guy we talked about last week, Antiochus Epiphanes. Uh, it's actually Antiochus the fourth Epiphanes. Um, because like I said, it, it happened for multiple generations long. Um, now this guy, um, it actually starts even a little bit before. So when it talks about the King of the North, it's talking about the Seleucids. When it says the King of the South, uh, it's talking about Egypt and the Ptolemies. Um, and the reason that chapter 11 focuses in so much on these two is because they flank Palestine on either side. Palestine is stuck right in the middle. So God's people are in Palestine. Today we call it Israel. And so they're kind of trapped in the middle. And so when one army goes from Egypt up north to Syria, they go through Palestine. And when the army from Syria goes down to Egypt, 
they go through Palestine. So um, God's people were stuck in the middle of this back and forth for uh, very long times, uh, periods of time. And the one guy that chapter 11 warns us about this Antiochus, the fourth Epiphanes, we'll just call him Antiochus. Um, he becomes the prototype for rulers who exalt themselves to the level of God. And um, let me look at my notes here. So he did becomes, you say, oh yeah, what? Did you say he was the first one to put himself in God Almighty's position? Yeah, um, Alexander approached that, but not to the same degree. Uh, Antiochus actually minted coins um, and uh, Epiphanes, if you remember from last week, um, Epiphanes means God manifest. Mm. And so even he named himself Epiphanes saying, I am God manifest. And it said it on the coins too. The coins, where did I write that? The coins actually were interesting because it calls him the victory bringer which is another term that's used for Zeus. And if you remember, Antiochus brought a statue of Zeus into God's temple and he canceled the sacrifices to the God of heaven and instituted sacrifices to Zeus. Now there were other gods, other Greek gods in the pantheon, but he preferred Zeus and called himself by the same titles, the victory bringer, um, God manifest. Do you remember what the people called him? Crazy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. They called him. Um, so Epiphanes is what he called himself. Um, Epimenes was what they called him, which meant crazy person, <laughs> mad man. So, yeah. Hmm. So that, that tells you what they thought of him. Okay, long story short, chapter 11 warns Daniel that in the future, a ruler is coming who will do these things. He will exalt himself to the level of divinity and he will persecute God's people. Now, of course, at the time, when Daniel received this vision, he did not have names for these. It just says the king of the north, the king of the south, but then it gives different specific details about each of the kings. What's amazing is that God gave this to Daniel hundreds of years before this actually happened. And now with hindsight, we can go back and we can see exactly how precise these things actually happened in real life. It's, it's rather incredible. And so um, the link that I'll give you that explains, um, it's actually the first and second Syrian wars and the first and second um, Egyptian wars that are described at the first part of chapter 11. Um, it goes into a lot of detail about that. And so you can see what happened in real life versus what is prophesied in the first part of chapter 11, um, hundreds of years before. Okay. There was one other thing I wanted to point out. So I, I um, talk a lot more about Antiochus in the previous video for chapters eight and nine. Um, and so when I get that out to you, you can learn more there. I'll also put more links in the video description as well. Um, he was not a nice guy. And not only did he put a, a statue of Zeus in the temple, he outlawed all Jewish practices because he wanted Jerusalem to be a Greek center of culture. And he wanted all Jews to become Greek citizens. Basically, renouncing um, their Jewish customs and laws. And it caused a lot of intense persecution. And so Antiochus becomes this prototype for rulers who impose a religion on a people and punish and martyr 
um, the subjects who don't comply. And that's what happens to God's people. And so that's why in chapter 11, he focuses in on these two specific on um, the king of the north, which is um, the Syrian ruler Antiochus, and then the king of the south, the Ptolemy ruler, because um, they're the ones that had direct impact on God's people. And so this vision should partially warn God's people that persecution is coming. But again, at the end, it, there's a time limit. And we talked a little bit about time limits last week because, you know, Daniel says, how long, how long is this going to continue or how long before all of this happens? And, um, you know, so there's some numbers given at the end, especially at the end of chapter 12. Um, and so it will be limited. It's not going to last forever. The persecution won't last forever because if we remember back to chapter two, God's kingdom does come. But again, looking backwards at history, you know, Christians believe that God's kingdom came when Jesus arrived. Jesus brought the kingdom of God on earth. And so um, we can see that with hindsight. Questions on chapter 11. I know I didn't give you a lot of specifics. What did you think of chapter 11? Very involved. Lots of information, very confusing. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> Lots of details. So again, that article that I'm going to share will explain who each of those people, who each of those rulers were. And um, it, it's actually pretty good reading when you just sit down and, and read it and you can see who murdered who to take over and who imprisoned someone else so they could take over. Um, and it follows chapter 11. It's very impressive. That, um, yeah. That's so much for Daniel to, to shoulder. That's a burden. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know how, how yeah. you would learn all of that and not just what do you do? I mean, who is, oh man. Yeah. And, and it's a lot. And so we, you know, when we get to chapter 12, you know, he basically says, protect this scroll with all this information because people in the future will need to read this. Mm -hmm. now, Daniel doesn't know when this is going to happen. Does he? Or Correct. does he? He, well, he's told in chapter eight, who the ram and the goat represent, that it's Persia and Greece. So he is told, but he doesn't know when. He doesn't know how long. Um, you know, and it, it says three kings plus a fourth, and then Greece will take over here in chapter 11. Uh, but again, timing, he it's not specific. Which so, makes sense with, mm -hmm. um, you know, how the Hebrews, the Hebrews were the opposite of us. They referred to yesterday as being in front of them and the past, I mean, the future is being behind them because mm -hmm. you can see what has happened, yeah. but you can't see what's behind you. And, you know, for Daniel, this vision, it's, it's all back there. He, he hasn't, he hasn't seen it. Mm -hmm. uh, how frightful. <laughs> yeah. I, I kind of think that I don't know. I guess I think about, you know, people talk about the short game and the long game. And I mm -hmm. think us as humans, our idea of a long game might be a few years or a few tens of years, but then you start to appreciate God's idea of the long game and why it was important to share it. So we could look back and see that he does have a vision. It's just a long game that we really can't fathom almost, but we can know he wins it. Mm -hmm. That's true. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It's also uh, interesting to see that humankind hasn't changed a whole lot. There's still <laughs> these things going on. Yeah. <laughs> That's the scary part, Betty. That's the scary part. I know. Yeah. Sam. Oh, yeah. Go ahead. Did it, 
Did Daniel tell these visions to the people? Not that I know of. It doesn't say that he did. Huh. So let's um let's skip down to chapter 12 here. Okay. So even though the title of your chapter 12, it, it might say the end times. I think that's what NIV says. Yeah. It really is referring to um, like Old Testament, like the end of the Old Testament. If we oh. use hindsight to look at it. Um, so at that time, Michael, the great prince who protects your people will arise. Um, and then it actually talks about resurrection, which is interesting. And then in verse four, he says, but you, Daniel, roll up and seal the words of the scroll until the time of the end. So I don't see where he reads it to anyone, but they would have kept, um, you know, the, the scrolls from other Old Testament books, well, what we call Old Testament, other books from the Hebrew Bible. Um, and so I would imagine he would have stuck that with his other scrolls, tucked it away for future reading, uh, which well, he had, he had to. If he had to steal it, then nobody could read it. Right. Correct. Well, yes. Um, that's an interesting point. So he was supposed to protect it, not necessarily keep people from reading it. Mm -hmm. So I read some other translations and they, they use different words instead of seal. I think it really should mean more protect because the point was for other people to read it down the line and we're reading it right now. So if it were really sealed, they would, right? Wouldn't you call the end of time, the end of that, it would have been the end of that um, era. Yes. Yep. And that's how some people get all hooey. They don't know history. And then they read that and they think it's when Jesus is coming back. And Right. Daniel, yeah, Daniel had no no um understanding of jesus coming let alone coming a second time like mm -hmm. that wasn't in his view right no correct so this could have been sealed and then whoever would have been the one to open it would have been mm -hmm. you know whoever is looking into that section of history then at that point in time and i don't know who that would have been um, yeah. Well, and also oh, cool. what was happening around this time was the Hebrew Bible was being compiled as one, one, one book, basically. And so everybody had kind of their own copies of the Torah or their own copy of the Isaiah scroll or the letter from Jeremiah that Daniel had read about the 70 years. And... Apparently now this scroll that, that we are reading that Daniel had recorded in, in chapters 10 to 12. And so the Babylonian exiles are the ones responsible for identifying the canon and assembling it together as a cohesive Hebrew Bible. And they also came up with um, their own commentaries. There's the Babylonian Talmud. Uh, which is a, a commentary, like the rabbis would give more teachings. And so that happened during exile as well. So I would imagine Daniel had access to many, many scrolls. Testing that resurrection is mentioned here in verse two. There are not many mentions of resurrection in the Old Testament at all. And um, when, you, when we fast forward to the first century with Jesus, um, you know, we read in the gospels about how the Sadducees were sad, you see, <laughs> because they did not believe in the resurrection. <laughs> um, the Pharisees did <laughs> the, the little kids like that joke. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So Daniel, oh, verse five, then I, Daniel looked, um, 
And there before me stood two others, one on this bank of the river and one on the opposite. So he's still in the same place at the Tigris River. <laughs> so this kind of, of um, book ends chapters 10 to 12. So this goes back to what you were talking about, Brenda, in, in verse eight. I heard, but I did not understand. My Lord, what will the outcome of all this be? Daniel doesn't really get a solid answer on this one. He's not given dates. He's not given names. He's, he's just told that many will be purified, made spotless and refined, uh, meaning there will be persecution of God's people, right? Because going in to, when you put iron in the fire, it purifies it. Or when you put gold into the fire, it purifies it. That's this, the metaphor. Uh, but the wicked will continue to be wicked. Which goes back to Betty's comment about, man, we haven't changed much. <laughs> so, <laughs> right? Yeah. Um, from the time that the daily sacrifice is abolished and the abomination that causes desolation is set up, that refers directly back to Antiochus Epiphanes, there will be 1,290 days. Um, again, it's not the exact days that matter. It's a symbol. Um Blessed is the one who waits for and reaches the end of those days. As for you, meaning Daniel, go your way till the end. You will rest. And then at the end of the days, you will rise to receive your allotted inheritance. Daniel will uh, die and receive his allotted inheritance um, in God's kingdom. So we don't know anything else about Daniel after this, except that there is a tomb. Actually, there's multiple tomb locations in the Middle East. Uh, one of them is actually down the street from Esther's tomb. Hmm. Hmm. Crazy. And I didn't, again, I didn't know that until I was researching Esther. Um, it is a place where people gather and they remember Daniel. They have celebrations there once a year. It's a lovely place. Um, I'll have to send you a, a picture of it. I didn't think to have it ready to go. Uh, but Daniel is still remembered in those areas today. Hmm. Pretty cool. So he never went back. He, he died there in Babylon. Correct. So the epilogue is Daniel died there in captivity mm -hmm. and never left. Hmm. So how sad that you know, especially in chapter nine, he prayed that exile would be over and that they could rebuild Jerusalem and the temple. He prayed for something he never got to see happen. Isn't that very Hebrews 11? Isn't that Hebrews yeah. 11? Yeah. So. Um, other epilogues to this, I mentioned that this is where they compiled the Hebrew Bible. Um, Ezekiel would have probably died by this point. Um, Jeremiah had been kidnapped and taken to Egypt when the exile started. I don't think he was still living at this point either. Um, but what comes next in the epilogue is, so Daniel's at the beginning of the Persian empire. We see, um, Xerxes and Esther near the end of the Persian empire. Um, and that is right after that is when, um, Ezra, well, or Nehemiah go to help rebuild, um, the wall around Jerusalem. They reinstitute the feasts, which hadn't been done in like a thousand years. And they, um, read the word of God aloud to the people. They help the people repent and turn to God. And because of that, the Messiah is allowed to to come through that line, still the line of David. Um, and that's how we get Jesus in the opening books of the New Testament. So because of Daniel's faithfulness, that allowed um, others to be faithful as well, which had this whole chain of events down through, um, down through Esther, 
and through Ezra and Nehemiah leading to Jesus. Pretty cool. So the message in Daniel, even though it's not written to us, we still get to apply it, is that God's people will experience hardship and suffering and even up to the point of martyrdom. But God is still sovereign and in control of what is happening in the world, is fighting for us in the background behind the curtain in the spiritual warfare, fighting for our survival. And in the end, his kingdom will crush the earthly kingdoms and his kingdom will endure. So as Christians, we are part of God's kingdom. And how comforting that no matter what man does to us on earth, that we have the hope of having um, salvation uh, through Jesus and be being in God's kingdom. And that is the book of Daniel. In a nutshell. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you. Very mm -hmm. good. Thank you. Now I know we're at 802, but if you have time, I would love to hear what surprised you in this book. I, I'm curious what, what did you maybe learn as a kid that now you realize, oh, that's not quite how that worked or anything. What, what surprised you guys in this whole study? Well, I didn't know what the, um, uh, the statues and all, what uh, nations it represented, what kingdoms it represented. So that was a new, a new thing to learn. Great. And now look how much history you know around that statue. Yeah, exactly. And, and uh, relating it all to the physical history that we know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. What else surprised you guys? It was nice to be walked through what the dreams all meant. You know, it was, it's so easy to just read Daniel with the two stories we know and a little bit about Nebuchadnezzar and then float through the rest because it doesn't make sense. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's easy to skip those, isn't it? <laughs> now it does make sense when you see, okay, these are the visions he gave to the king. These are the visions he gave to Daniel. Mm -hmm. Same story just giving them to the two different people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What surprised me was how much Jesus referred to the book of Daniel. I didn't mm -hmm. realize that's how he really understood himself. Like he was Daniel seven, the son of man. Like yeah. he was proclaiming himself to be deity saying that God exalted him. And I didn't realize that about when he was on trial. So that surprised me the most. Well, we were, Stephanie and I were talking about this. Um, for some reason, from my childhood, I have this, you know, Old Testament, long time of silence, New Testament. Mm -hmm. And that's really not true. Yeah. It, it kind of goes back to what Dr. Beth said. Um, you know, we put it in our time frame. That seems like a long time. It was yeah. not a long time. Mm hmm. Absolutely. Especially when you see the statue and how the empires just rolled one into the other into the other. So, yeah. All right. I have, I have another question for you. How did this change your perspective on life? Did this study help you at all with how you think about life? How you think about the church? How you think about governments? Yes, and I don't like it because I've been praying really, really hard that our country return to the Lord and things go on and things smooth out. And mm -hmm. this is my reality check that it's God in control. Amen. Yeah, that's what I've realized too. Yeah, and as much as, at least in America, as our country has Christian origins, that doesn't mean 
all of the people or all of the leaders will continue in that path. I mean, just like we saw in the book of Daniel, every leader takes it their own direction and may or may not acknowledge mm -hmm. God. Well, and it really hit me last week when you were talking about the, the Greeks, uh, I mean, the Hellenistic uh, Jews and the traditional Jews and, you know, how changing a few traditions and what an impact that made and what a division that made. And, you know, Christian is kind of a loose term anymore. Mm -hmm. I also like the fact that, um, in chapter 11, when the angel talks to Daniel, he says, do not be afraid. Even though Daniel will not see these things in his lifetime, he's still asking him, don't be afraid. It'll be taken care of. So we need to try and remember not to be afraid. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he said it twice. So we better pay attention. Good observation, Betty. Thank you. So what's your one takeaway? If you could, if you take away one thing from this class, what would it be? That I need to read this again <laughs> and, and put it all together again <laughs> instead enough. of just just the, uh, the stories that we grew up with, that I grew up with, so. I would say that, I would say that we have to continue to endure through suffering. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna go and say it's uh, God's protection mm -hmm. to his children. And you know, uh, he's the one in control. That's what my take away on Daniel. I think for me, um, just that, that initial concept we talked at the very beginning about how to live in exile and that idea that in a way we're still in that exile and there is a way that God wants us to live and to kind of, I've circled back to that thought more than once through the study. Yeah, me too. Yeah. Me too. I think for me, just God is in control. Mm -hmm. not just not just daniel as a boy i mean this is he was an old an old decades. man yeah. decades yeah yeah this is 80 85 year old daniel <laughs> and and never never gave in to that culture in the world but not of the world mm -hmm. mm -hmm. yeah yeah, I think he's our best example of that for sure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So thinking about all of that and then back to Beth's comment, what are some ways, last question, what are some ways you guys are going to work on um, being faithful? In what ways will you be faithful based on what you learned in this book? I think one of the ways that I'm struggling right now is uh, realizing joy mm. and being a role model of that to generations under me, my children, my grandchildren, and the people I'm with every day. I, I need to show and live in the joy and the realization that yes, I am an exile. Yes, I am. And, uh, but there's something that, but I, I'm supposed to show joy and li live in that joy. And that's hard, I think, right now. There's a lot happening in our world that is not joyful. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Norma. Trying to be consistent, consistent with uh, in our uh, in my Christian faith, mm -hmm. even through all the trials, because to see Daniel being consistent in that, but not in a forceful way, in a calm and gentle. 
That's my niece. Oh. <laughs> Sorry for the interruption, Betty. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Betty. Consistency can be hard for sure. Yes. Mm -hmm. Anyone else want to share? How will this help you to be more faithful? What will you do to be faithful? Thank you. Uh, a lot of years, uh, we need to go and uh, we just like uh, when Daniel uh, facing trials, he prayed and mm -hmm. praying and praying. So I think uh, if we're going to be prayerful, you know, he, I'm just going to go put it. He's in the one in control, but that's our, as a Christian that we need to go and plea appeal and give thankfulness into the Lord. Thank you, Remy. One thing, Sam, that I took away from these lessons and that I kind of keep going back to is in week five, you talked about the peace ethic and how um, in Jeremiah, it talks about uh, praying for the empire because their success is our success. And I've really um, come away from this, uh, really focusing on my prayer life and trying to do a better job of praying in general, but um, doing a lot more uh, peaceful praying for our, um, our leaders and those who are in charge. And that can be so hard when we disagree with them politically. So you really have to humble yourself for that. Mm -hmm. That's hard. Thanks for sharing that, April. So it kind of sounds like God chose, this would be a good time for Sam to do some lessons on Daniel. I agree. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, this has been on my heart to teach this for about 10 years. I have to be <laughs> honest. I approached Kimberly Yakely back when we were doing summer Bible studies and I was like, please let us do Daniel, please. But honestly, back then I was not ready. I wasn't ready to hear some of the lessons from Daniel. So, um, I, yeah, there's a lot to be said about waiting on God's timing mm -hmm. and he really put it on my heart to do this. And I really hesitated at first because I thought, you know, what if politics get in the way or what if, what if we have some people who are really into American politics and for one particular candidate and they just talk through the whole lesson. I had a lot of fears about this. <laughs> and I'm sure some of you might have too at first. <laughs> like, what are they going to say? <laughs> but this has worked out so well. And, and honestly, I've gone back to, um, I think it's Romans 15, 2. And it talks about our purpose as Christians is to help each other mature. Mm-hmm. And that's what I wanted to accomplish through this class. And um, not just so I could be the sage on the stage and deliver all the content to you, but so we could all help each other figure out how are we going to take what we learned and actually make it happen in our lives. And it sounds like you guys have really thought through this and you've, you've got a great start. You may not have it nailed yet, <laughs> yeah. but... I don't know that any of us will ever get to um, perfect our walk on earth. That's why we need grace. But I am so glad that all of you stuck through these 10 weeks and through all of these crazy visions and beasts and um, <laughs> wars and evil rulers and you stuck through it and you made it to the end where the angel says, blessed is the one who waits for and reaches the end of this. You guys did it. Thank you so much for being a part of this.
You did a great thank job. You. Thank, yeah. you. thank you for so, teaching thank us. Thank you. Thank thank you so and thank you to you. You guys did all your homework. Yeah, it was good. It was fun homework. <laughs> okay, um, I'll take requests for what class to do next fall. Not Ezekiel. Now. Email me. Ezekiel. Ezekiel. <laughs> Ezekiel. Okay. Noted. <laughs> Send me your request. Um, I'll get this video uh, edited and sent out with last week's video too. So you guys will have the full playlist. Uh, if you want to go back, like Betty said, go back and tackle it again now all at once. <laughs> More power to you. Okay. I've got to watch the ones I missed. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, Rini says, thanks so much. How about Esther? Ooh, I could talk for days about Esther. That would be good. <laughs> that would be a good one. Um, that would be fun to revisit right on the heels of Daniel. Wouldn't it? Mm -hmm. Yes, mm -hmm. that's true. Okay. All right. My mind's working through it. We'll see what we can come up okay with. Okay, with anything you teach. Yeah. You, yeah. you just, whatever you want to teach. We're, I'm willing to learn. <laughs> well, so much. That overwhelms me a bit. There's so many topics. <laughs> oh, you guys are the best. Thank you for being so encouraging. Um, even when I mispronounce names and it sounds funny. And <laughs> we didn't know. <laughs> go down no. <laughs> okay, I got to let you guys go. <laughs> okay, bye. 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 bye.